the difference between like anti-Semitism and anti-Zionist. And they're tricking everyone to thinking that people who define themselves as Zionists are supporting evil. And they're trying to redefine anti-Zionism by anti-colonialism in order to attach colonialism to Zionism. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I like your background. Thank you. <laughs> First thing everyone tells me. <laughs> um, I am captivated by the way you um, go to work because it's uh, something I haven't seen that much um, in the last years uh, because, you know, the discourse is quite aggressive, you know, between uh, Jewish people, especially when the topic is Israel. Uh, so, my first question is, um, what 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 drives you? What what makes you tick? Um, so, I think you're more so asking about how I stay so calm and composed, and how I handle certain situations, and maybe try to find uh, more nuance. Where are you from? I'm from Israel. No, I'm saying where are your grandparents from? You want to know where my grandparents were yeah, born, or where they were from? Where were they from? The, the where are they from is from Israel. You get a lot of abuse, uh, like in the first ten minutes, usually. Yeah. So. <laughs> so there, there's a few there's a few elements. Um, first of all, I've always been someone that's very calm and collected and grounded. Uh, I've never lost my cool. I've been mad several times, but I've never lost my temper to a point that I don't have control over my emotions and my body and my actions. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I always believe that there's a possibility of light within every individual, even if they're convinced that they are in a position that's anti what I believe or anti me and my family. Um, clearly, everyone at the end of the day thinks they're right in their own mind. Uh, they think they're the good guy or the good girl in their story, in their mind. And so there must be something that led them to that conclusion that if I try to understand and break down, I could try to find a way to relate what I mean and what I say and what I believe to their narrative and worldview. So I think I always approach a situation by trying to figure out what's the more holistic version of the truth and the reality, uh, because I think truth is holistic because one person can have a truth and another person can have a truth and both truths can be real uh, because those are both their perceptions and their experiences. However, one person may choose certain elements and facts to collect their narrative and the other person can do the same. And that's usually where differences happen. Um, also, when I'm in these conversations, a lot of the times is something that many people don't realize. I often don't know what the person's position is until way later in the conversation. It's not like I knew they were going to say something like that. So a lot of the times when things are being said, it's surprising it's in the moment. And it's not like I'm giving this person a platform or went and engaged with this person because of their opinions. I didn't know what they would say and what they would do. Uh, but I think the most important thing that maybe other people should take away from why I think I stay calm and everything else is in those moments when you speak as a Jew, as an Israeli, as a Zionist to someone that is anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist, anti-Israelis, in that moment you represent the whole collective that that person sees you through the lens of. So if you lose your cool, if you scream, if you don't speak respectfully or intellectually, then everyone will see, oh, that's how <laughs> Jews react. That's how Zionists react. That's how Israelis react. Well, unfortunately, I, yeah, unfortunately, in the in the in the discourse, you know, either Jews don't react at all or they react on the internet, but the reaction usually is very defensive or, you know, um, and I think it's a, a, a also a, like a, a sickness of this time that it, it, it's like the identity politics, right? So you just want to show how awful the other is and not really come together. So what I find so fascinating about you is how do you keep your composure? Because I feel you already know uh, you're going to get attacked like in the first five to 10 minutes and then you just start breaking down, uh, you know, the, 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 the conversation, the narrative. So you touched on a few good points there. First of all, when it comes to the Jewish community, there's definitely in at least the diasporic Jewish community an element of apathy that exists. Um, and I think this apathy comes from a lot of trauma of our experience in the diaspora that has caused for a lot of Jews to 
uh, have sort of three different reactions. Let's say in psychology, if a woman is in an abusive relationship with a man and the man, uh, you know, God forbid, beats this woman, there are three ways usually in which a woman can react to such a trauma. She can fight back and refuse to accept that and remove herself from that situation, which is when I deal with anti-Semitism, I stand up to it. I don't just accept it. Then there are women who kind of make excuses to it pretend it's not that big of an issue. Oh, no, it was just one time. Oh, no, he was just drunk. And that's what I think most Jews in the diaspora do when it comes to anti-Semitism. Oh, no, it's not that bad. Or, oh, if we just focus on ourselves, you know, we'll, we'll be successful and kind of avoid the problem that they should be dealing with because there is trauma that they've had to unpack and also uh, bad issues that are happening right now in society that they need to address. But then there's the third element of, which is the worst, of blaming yourself. Women who then say, no, no, it was my fault. I shouldn't have done that. I should have cleaned. I shouldn't have spoken back, which is, I think, the worst uh, layer of sort of how to deal with trauma. And you see even many Jews siding with their oppressors and taking a position that's anti-Zionist or anti-Semitic from the religious to the secular. Um, and that's all because of trauma. So that's very much so real uh, within the Jewish community. And I think a lot of our education as Jews in the diaspora was always, you know, how to be Jews in theory and not Jews in practice. So learning certain elements of our culture and history and traditions, but not how to be strong in the world today with the situations we're dealing with today. Um, but something for me that helps me a lot when I'm speaking to uh, someone that, let's say, is pro-Palestinian or a Palestinian themselves, um, I first of all see them as my cousins, Palestinians. I realize that there's no future in the land without Israelis or without Palestinians. So I'm not approaching the situation from a zero sum game of, you know, anything that happens good to you is inherently bad for me. And anything that's good for me is inherently bad for you. I actually see anything that's bad for you or bad for me is bad for both of us because there's no reality where either disappear. So if we only continue this conflict and one side is hurt, both sides are hurt at the end of the day. And I think the, the thing that also helps me a lot in these conversations is knowing the narratives of the other side better than the other side. Yeah. So whenever someone brings up an argument, uh, I immediately know what they're sourcing, what they're referencing, what they're saying, and I know their arguments better than they do. Well, it's interesting <clears throat> that you choose um, to be compassionate towards uh, the people you debate with. You know, you do not disqualify their pain. You know, you actually, you know, engage in it. You know, you... <clears throat> you recognize it, which really helps. Uh, I, I can tell uh, what, what you post, you know, it's like people, whenever <clears throat> they get the feeling you're taking them seriously, um, the debate opens up, you know, you, they, then they open up to you too and, and whatever you have to say. So what I find interesting is why didn't we do this before? The way you go into this debate, how come uh, it is, it's, it's this young Israeli guy who maybe found a key to to real talk um i don't know i think uh, a lot of people are raised with certain ideas of other people without ever meeting or understanding what those other people are and are never interested in breaking through i can share sort of my personal experiences what made me uh starting on a path of trying to like find out what the other side believes and feels and how they how we can come together is uh in america there's an organization called apac uh, I'm not a fan of everything APAC stands for. There's a plenty of things that I disagree with. However, they have a policy conference every single year, which is the biggest pro-Israel conference in the world. There are like 18,000 people show up. Uh, so every year, as even in middle school and high school, I would come with my father and we would sit inside the conference, listen to all these speakers. And I realized that they were always saying the same thing. Right. And so one year I decided to go outside and to start speaking to the protesters that were anti-Israel. And in that process, I sort of saw the humanity and what a lot of people you know, were expressing and what they were showing and what they were talking about. And I saw that they truly cared about Palestinians. And I wanted to find out what, well, what is this cause that you're supporting that I know nothing of, right? Something that I would say to the Jewish community is we were so never taught anything. To actually. Yeah, well, I wanted to, to do many things. <clears throat> I wanted to know how to defend Israel, not only uh, amongst the echo chamber that we exist in. So not only saying the things that sounds right to us, but also learn how to say things that sound right to the world and also others, uh, and also understand their position and find out how do we actually come together. And through engaging with a lot of people, it started to 
make me realize, okay, well, they just mentioned this. I know nothing about it. I should look it up and find out if there's anything real about it that I should support and side with, or if it's another use of an excuse to demonize Israel that I should know next time how to respond to and kind of differentiate it, differentiate between the two. But I would also say that I think social media is a huge factor in this. I think my generation, millennials and now Gen Zs, grew up with either the coming of social media or with social media in their lives, their whole lives. And that has allowed us to be more interconnected with others. It also made us more polarized because we keep getting fed what we already believe and we get into these echo chambers. Also but we do have- Just uh, search for, you know, to, yeah. they search for what they want to hear. Yeah, and, uh, and the algorithms on social media will show you what you already mm -hmm. like. Yeah. However, there's also an ability through social media that has a good side to reach out to and see and contact others that you would have never been able to. Right. And I think if you look on platforms like on, on TikTok, for example, that's one of the newer social media platforms, Israelis and Palestinians are constantly seeing each other's content, are constantly seeing each other's faces and expression, whether of their ideas, of their art, of whatever it is, and through understanding each other's humanity and experiencing that, and then being able to comment and reach out and send messages and then set up Zoom calls. And the ability of social media is not only something that's negative that causes people to, to be polarized, that is a factor that has to be uh, taken into consideration to make sure that this problem doesn't continue, but it also allows people to be more so interconnected and gives the possibility to actually reach out to the other side. And I think because we have that, I see a shift happening amongst the younger generation of Israelis and Palestinians. Well, <clears throat> that's the positive um you know, a point of, uh, of uh, social media. But I guess up until now, it didn't really help because of the algorithms. But um, I do agree, you know, that, that new social media might, might be the key to, to real uh, debate, real conversation, real seeing each other's humanities. Um, but to get back to uh, your work at the universities, you know, uh, because there's a, a big difference between what you experience in the USA maybe in France and, for example, what we have uh, in Holland. <clears throat> because in Holland, you know, there is anti-Semitism and I guess we have the same <clears throat> problems, but for some reason, uh, you know, because if you talk to the individual, that's a different animal than if you talk to the, to the collective, right? And the collective is an organism that actually, you know, becomes one, right? It's one narrative. So well, it should be one, but it's it's kind of like divided. So if you look at the right versus the left, there are many things that are good and bad with the right. And there are many things that are good and bad with the left. But why do we need to be divided on those two issues? Like if I bring it back to Israeli politics, for example, which right and left is different in different societies in Israel, being right is more about identity and security and being left is about human rights and justice. Why do these two things contradict? Why can't I also care about human rights? and justice and values and care about identity and security. And so we've been convinced that these two things contradict and people who more so care about identity and security tend to fall on the right and not care anymore about, uh, about human rights and justice. And people who care more about human rights and justice tend to like be forced to reject identity and security. And so I think it's the system that exists, especially the political systems that force populations to uh, sort of fight each other rather than figure out how to coexist together. And you're talking about a unit, a collective. I see this world as, as a body, right? Mm -hmm. But within a singular body, there are individual, very different organs. And in order for the organs to work together, they have to know how they are unique and what function they play and work well with the other organs. So if the heart thinks that it's the brain, that thinks it's the liver, that thinks it's the arms, your body is going to be sick and naturally it's going to fight one another. So I think that we need to understand that there's a balance. There's a balance between caring of the collective and also caring of the individual. We shouldn't reject completely the idea of caring of the individual and we shouldn't reject completely the idea of caring about the collective. And that's when you look at the even economic systems of capitalism and communism. Communism is all about the collective and forget the individual. And capitalism is all about the individual and forget the collective. And I think both of those systems are flawed in many ways. There are positives within both, but we have to find something that actually helps us unite amongst our differences 
rather than use those differences to be against one another. Yeah, beautifully spoken. Um, so the, the, the only thing I feel <clears throat> when, when I see you uh, on these campuses, it's like you are fighting on your own this huge wave, right? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what feedback do, do you get after about a couple of years of social media doing your work? How are you being perceived by these uh, students? How, <clears throat> how, are, how are they treating you? Um, are you still their enemy? Are you now someone they, they love to debate with, talk to, a go-to guy maybe for some information? So I think the, all the extremes, I'm like their public enemy number one because my Still. goal is to eliminate the extremes and to bring people together. And in their worldview, the other side that I also care about, even if I care about the things that exist on their side, the fact that I also care about what exists on the other side makes me an enemy. And that's kind of what you look on the right and the left in America today because it's so polarized and bec has become so extreme. If someone is on the left, that makes them an enemy to the right. And if someone is on the right, that makes them an enemy to the left, rather than understanding, okay, this person cares more about these issues. This person cares more about each, these issues. How do we create something that actually allows all those issues to be taken into consideration? Um, on campuses, it really depends. Uh, there are a lot of people over the years. I mean, I've, I've received thousands of messages. I'm, I received maybe over 50 to 200 messages on social media a week. Uh, of people either asking questions, of people who are like saw one video and started binge watching all of them. Uh, you've changed my perspective. You've taught me who I was as a Jew. Uh, I'm a Palestinian. I was taught to hate, and now I realize that there's another way. And so th there are a bunch of beautiful messages that I see the shift, but I also see the shift outside of my work, where I see a lot of young uh, Israeli and Palestinian activists coming out and creating their own path using their own light and their own abilities and their own skills and actually going out and spreading light to the world and no longer seeing Palestinians as the enemy and no longer seeing Israelis as, as the enemy. And so I really am very optimistic in general, but I'm even more so optimistic because I see, I see the change happening outside of even the responses that I receive on my page. Yeah, well, I, I gotta admit, you even changed my perspective a little bit. <laughs> and I'm a 41 year old man. Um, but th what I found very interesting about, um, say, Jewish identity, you know, um, what you, you, your, your uh, thoughts about that. Before, um, I never considered even, you know, like the, the idea of one country for both peoples, right? I always thought Israel is basically already dead, but it's not yet, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then <clears throat> you touched down on something um, that is on the, 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 the Jewish identity uh, uh, perspective, that religion does not per se embody the Jew, you know, it's also an ethnicity, a culture, a language, uh, a piece of land, you know, where we hail from. Um, these things I always thought, but even within the Jewish community, these are very sensitive topics. For example, you know, if you talk to a very religious Jew and you say, no, it's also an, an ethnicity, they will most likely not agree. But then again, if you treat it as an ethnicity, it makes much more sense, actually, you know, as a people, as a, as a whole, and our collective uh, identity and history. So then you uh, uh, use that to make uh, a statement when you get into the debate with the, the people is like, Okay, so we're native to Israel. It's our ethnicity, it's our religion, it's the whole suitcase you talk about with, you know, our heritage. How do people respond when you say we're indigenous? Because, you know, that, that is very uh, sensitive to the, for them, but also because they are doing very much their, uh, uh, you know, their best to delegitimize our, uh, you know, uh, nativeness to the land. So to touch back on the points, I think when it comes to, you were talking about how can we create a reality where both Israelis and Palestinians can live on this land is we have to understand that we have different 
sufferings, like both people experience suffering in a different way, and we also have different aspirations. So we need to create a reality in the land that when Jews are in this country, in this civilization, they feel that this is a Jewish state. They feel that this is a Jewish civilization that fulfills their needs and create also a reality that when Palestinians are living there, they also feel that this is a reality for them. This is their civilization for them, too. And I think that is what's really important in order to create. Um, in terms of religion, if I'm debating with someone that's religious in the sense, because even the word religious, what does that mean? You can be religious about following sports. You can be religious about following politics. So religious doesn't necessarily mean you're orthodox. It just means you're doing everything to the uh, extent of what you believe in to the fullest. So even this word religious, I kind of have a problem of there being a monopoly of one group saying that they're the ones that are religious. Mm -hmm. But Judaism is not a religion at all. And I'll tell you why. Religion is not a Jewish word. It's not a Hebrew word. It's not from the Torah. It comes from the Latin words, English, from, from French, and, and so on. And it is defined as the belief system in a God, deity, book, or prophet. Right. So if you look at actual religions, if you don't believe in the God, deity, book, or prophet, you are not a part of that religion. Let's give an example. If you are a Christian and you are to reject Jesus, you are now no longer a Christian. Right. If you are a Muslim and you reject the Quran and Muhammad, you are no longer a Muslim. If you are a Buddhist and you reject the philosophies of Buddha, you are now no longer a Buddhist. And on the other hand, if you accept Jesus, you become a Christian like that. You accept Muhammad and you do the wash and you do the prayer and everything, you become a Muslim like that. You accept the teachings of philosophy of Buddha, you become a Buddhist. Those are religions. So it's an idea that crosses over borders that one can adopt. When it comes to Judaism, if one were to say, let's say someone that's not Jewish says, oh, I believe in the Torah and I believe in, in God, that doesn't make them a Jew. They'd have to go through years of a process of adopting an identity, a right. history, a culture, a value system, being part of a nation. Yeah. And if you look at someone that's Jewish and rejects the elements of our spirituality, let's say they say, I don't believe in the Torah and I don't believe in God, they're still Jewish, not right. more than any less than anyone else. So if we actually apply the definition of religion and look at actual religions and compare that to what Judaism is, it is actually not the same at all. Because a religion is only a belief system, keyword only, for yeah. any people, keyword any. And Judaism isn't only a belief system. It has a belief system included within it, but it's not only that. And it is not for any people. It is for one people. So, and so when you actually understand what religion means and what uh, the definition is, and you also understand Judaism, they don't go together. And I think just to, before you, you go on, a lot of Jews, when they say Judaism is a religion, what they mean by that is that there's a spirituality that, and a belief system that exists within Judaism, which is true, but that's not religion. I have a question. So yeah. if, if I follow this uh, to the bone, I can be ethnically Jewish and practice my faith as a Muslim. Yes. <laughs> All right. And um, wow. Because anyone could decide to, that doesn't mean that the next generation they're going to be Jewish. Because yeah. if the mother isn't Jewish and that culture and identity is passed down, it's going to eventually die out and not be passed down. Yeah. But in the individual, no matter what they believe, if they reject uh, God, if they reject the Torah, if they, if they believe in it, don't believe in it, go up and downs, believe in other things, they're still a Jew because they are the descendant and part of a collective of a physical indigenous nation to the land of Israel. And I'll give you just another example so you can match the two. If we look at other indigenous peoples, like let's say the Native Americans, yeah. right? There are many Native American nations and each nation sort of has their own deities. The spirit of the wolf and the mountain spirit and the moon god and all these different deities. Right. If an individual Native American did not believe in those deities, would that Native make American. that yeah. they still Native American? And that's yeah. why being a Native American is not considered a religion. So right. we shouldn't hold a double standard when it comes to Judaism because we are just as native to Judea as they are to the Americas. And they also have religious sort of spiritual elements, belief systems within their culture. But, and uh, so do we. But I do think like the, the religion is, is important to that sense. It, it is our system of values, you know. Uh, uh, you know well, I just think it's not called religion. Well, we can say that the spiritual belief system that is a part of our culture, it's a fundamental part of our culture. But again, 
that's the problem. That when when we think about that as Jews, we t- always connect the word religion there. Yeah. But when you actually define religion, and you realize what it means, not only in the de- dictionary, but what it means to the whole world, it's not at all what we're using it as and what we've understood it as. It does not mean the belief system of a native people. It means the belief system of any people, anywhere, right. at any time, only if they accept it or not. Um, so how are you be- being perceived within uh, the Jewish community? You know, How do they react to your uh, ideas? I think, uh, you know, for a lot of people that are, I would say, younger, my ideas and the things that I say are that are very much so, it's like they can finally relate to something because there's sort of a, a, a frustration that a lot of us had, including myself, when it came to Jewish education right. that didn't fulfill a lot of the needs and the questions that we had. Uh, so who are we? Are we just a belief system or are we a people? Now we have Israel, but what does that mean? And we're, we're Jewish, but we're also American and we're French. Like, are we really American? Are we really French? Like, and the, the older generation didn't really provide us with these answers. Right. And I think I'm trying to create a space to provide this information that I've found myself, but that isn't really accessible for most people, especially in mainstream organizations. And so I think with the younger generation is where uh, most of my audience is located that wants to hear what I have to say. But again, I didn't make up these ideas. You know, ideas are you know, recycled and, and spread. And I, well, I think anyone can come up to these conclusions. I, I, do, I, I do find it very refreshing, <clears throat> uh, but, I, but I, I had some questions, right? But uh, I've shown your, uh, your, your content uh, to a couple of uh, friends, young people also, uh, who have either just one Jewish parent, uh, the, the dad or the, the, the grandpa, the grandma, and they always felt uh, a bit disqualified by the, the Jewish community in Holland. You know, it's like, yeah, you're not really one, one of us. Uh, but now, you know, if you uh, approach it as an ethnicity, that means it's in your blood, it's in your DNA. That means you are part of uh, the, the Jewish people. How do you, how do you feel about that? If people uh, look at it that way. Well, uh, each nation, indigenous peoples, defines who they are in their own way. If you look at Native American nations, uh, a lot of those nations have a way for one to actually become a Native American. And it's actually almost very similar slash identical to converting to Judaism because one has to go through several tests, uh, you know, journeys of, you know, adopting an identity, adopting a history, adopting the language, adopting the value system, and then at the end being accepted by a council of elders. That's what it means when someone becomes a Jew. So if we look at it towards Jews, like in our culture, if the mother is Jewish, the child is Jewish. Mm -hmm. But if the mother and father isn't Jewish or only the father is Jewish, the child can be Jewish if they achieve a certain level, meaning a level of being interconnected with the native people, native collective, native culture. So if we look at the, you know, the, history that we had, all the forefathers, whether they were real or not real, the idea of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and later with Moses and Joshua, and all these different individuals, their wives were not born into the nation of Israel. They were born from other nations. Did they go through the conversion process that we have today? No. What they went through is achieving a certain level where they've now become and immersed themselves to the fullest to a part of a collective. Right. And that's what I think makes someone Jewish that doesn't have a Jewish mother. They can they can have a Jewish father. Right. So I'll give you an example. Let's say someone is uh, is born with a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother, but the father uh, marries a Jewish woman and they're raised their whole lives thinking that their mother is Jewish and that's the real mother. And yeah. they find out later in their 20s and their 30s that, oh, that's actually not my mother and my mother wasn't Jewish. So technically, according to the rabbis, I'm not considered Jewish. Is she not Jewish or is he not Jewish? And the answer, in my opinion, is they are absolutely Jewish because they've reached the level that is required for one to reach to in order for someone to convert. So they've already done that through growing up in their whole lives. Right. And for me, it's through my bloodline, you know, but but maybe also. also, well, Well, do you believe that someone can convert to Judaism? Sorry? Do you believe that someone can become a Jew if they're born not Jewish? Um, yeah, I, I do. I do believe that, but I think it's more on a religious level because you know you you convert. So 
about um, your goals for the future. Uh, what, do, what do you dream of uh, achieving with your work right now? Where are you heading? So there are many different things that I focus my work on. I've always had three goals. Um, so personal to the two, the first two are more so personal goals. So establishing a strong and healthy Jewish family in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. The second one would be, you know, being uh, successful in on a level both like, you know, spiritually and, you know, materially. So, you know, having uh, enough financial success to open all doors for me and my family members, uh, even health in itself, being successful in, in, in being a healthy person. And the third goal that I've always had is how do I play a role in this generation to be a sort of character of Jewish history? And what I mean by that is if I look in the past, during different chapters of Jewish history, there are different individuals that played a role in their own way to help the Jewish people move forward. Right. And my question that, you know, obviously don't know the future, but I need to find a way every single day to ask that question for myself. How do I help and use the skills and tools that I have while still trying to acquire new skills with time? How do I use that in order to help the Jewish people move forward in the next chapter of Jewish history? In practice, I fight against anti-Semitism. I try to empower the next generation of Jews. Uh, I try to like make people understand their identity. Uh, I try to create coexistence, not only between Israelis and Palestinians in the land, but between the sectors of Israeli society, the right, the left, the religious, the secular. Um, and overall, I think that once we fix ourselves as the Jewish people and also fix ourselves with our neighbors, first the Palestinians and then the rest of the region, then we can start healing the whole world. And again, this this uh, metaphor of, uh, of, a, of a body, right, and different organs being together, if the organs aren't working with one another, or even if the organs themselves, the cells within the organs are not working together, then you have a totally sick body. And that's why I think a lot of this world is, you know, there are many problems that exist in this world is because we haven't fixed the root problem. Yeah. So, uh, let me get back uh, to to this body that we call Israel and and all her organs. You know, the, let's say okay. the, the Orthodox organs, the, the the secular Jewish organs, the the Arab Christian organs, the the, the Muslims, etc. You know, this this is what all the roots that hold the tree up, right? Okay. So, um, a lot of people uh, might think that the let's say the the difference between the mentality and the cultures uh, of the two peoples to generate to generalize it in just two people say um that that would be very hard because one uh you know um might be more deeply religious and uses religion as a justification for violence and the other side uh, is maybe really defensive and protective of the identity because maybe we're going to lose the Jewish identity if we become one one land one country <clears throat> how how do you see that because if you integrate the two peoples completely and fairly we cannot call it Israel anymore we cannot it doesn't have a Jewish identity anymore so how do you see that so First of all, I don't call it one country or one state. I call it one civilization, which intentionally leaves it vague for us to leave the doors open to figuring out the solution that I don't think anyone yet has. Uh, there are many different theoretical approaches as to how a solution can exist, and I can illustrate a few of them. Um, but before I kind of break that down, I'm going to give you another analogy right. um, to explain how we need to look at the situation to finding a solution. So if I'm an artist, uh, before I pick the frame that I'm going to use for my masterpiece, the first thing I'm going to do is come up with an idea of what I want to create. Right. Then I'm going to pick the canvas, the size, the texture, then the paint brushes and the paint colors. And, you know, I'm going to start my painting, then I'm going to mess up, then I'm going to fix it. And by right. the time I finish, I'm going to take a step back and then look at my painting and say, you know what, on this painting, I need a texturized, thin metallic frame. Or on this painting, I need a simple, thick wooden frame, right? right? You pick the frame at the end. And like you can go to a frame store and say, one day I would like to make a painting with this. Or I think the painting that I have envisioned is going to fit this. But by the end, it might not fit at all. 
So I think thinking of a, a solution now is theorizing what type of frame will fit on the painting in which the Israelis and Palestinians are the artists for that they haven't even come together to discuss what type of painting they want to create. Right. So we can theorize of what future frames will exist, but it's a process. So it shouldn't be, hey, I have the answer. I'm going to impose it from the from the top to the bottom. It has to be a work in progress from the bottom up to build that together and to overcome the obstacles as they come. Now, if you want a hypothetical idea of what a solution could look like, first of all, you said, these two peoples coming together. There are many other peoples in, in this land. Right. There's the Druzim, there's the Armenian, there's the Greek Orthodox, there's the Bedouin, and the Druzim have their own flag, have their own identity, have a separation between the Jews because they don't intermarry with Jews, they only marry amongst Druzim, they have their own culture, but their experience within Israel is that Israel is, is their home. Yeah. So how is it a Jewish state, but yet non-Jews feel that this is their civilization because right. the civilization that was created fulfills their needs but it doesn't fulfill the needs of every single group. It's now specifically the Palestinians. So we need to find a way to, how do we create a system here, a reality here, that fulfills the needs economically, uh, spiritually, in terms of dignity, in terms of human rights, in terms of equality, for others besides just those that have achieved uh, their needs of their culture. And so I think if we look at uh, the situation right now, let's put Gaza to the side, and talk about Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, if we were to create a federation system where we would have, and again, this is a hypothetical solution. It's like not the United solution. States of Israel, Palestine. Um, not necessarily, but it would sort of be like a two body system, which you do have three, uh, you know, legislative, judicial and executive, uh, but you have two bodies where one would have more local power and one would have more national power because to Palestinians, what they really care about is having local power having the families that run uh, Kfar Hussan or the that's families the short that run term wish. That's the short-term wish. But say, <clears throat> let's say they get the local power because like uh, the first time I went backpacking through Israel, I think it was the late 90s, they had a lot of local power. They were pretty autonomous. You know, this was a good time. I think it was 99. <clears throat> you know, they had their own authority, they had their, their arms, their own police. I went to R Ramallah, I went to Jericho. I could travel freely right <clears throat> but say you know they get a lot of autonomy and local power the next step of course is to get national power how is that going to work but i would say that they never did have the local power you're, you're you're i think talking about the palestinian authority right and the palestinian authority does not represent the palestinian people they're on their 15th 16th year of their four-year term and yeah. almost every single palestinian not every but almost every single one whether in the diaspora or in israel or in the Judean Samaria or in Gaza, hates the PA. Yeah. So you they, know what, that's not what I mean by, by local authority. Okay, I what do you mean by local authority? authority? Because you know there's I mean, other people I, who okay. the Israeli so, government too, Jewish people. So so I'll explain. When I go to Hebron or when I go to Kfal Hussan or when you go to uh, Nablus Shrem or to Ramallah or to different places, the way the structure of the Palestinian society works is you have different families that run that city. Run it's the city tribal, and the small tribal, cities around. Tribal way of, yeah, it's very it's, tribal. Yeah. And they want it to be that way. They right. don't want this national control of the Palestinian Authority that controls the families of Hebron and the families of Shrem Nablus and the families of uh, Kfar Hussan. And what I'm telling you about local control is when you go to that place and you say, who is the leader or the leaders of this community, of this region, of this city, they don't tell you Abu Mazen. And they no. said, yeah, he's kind of in control of everything, but the local leaders are them. Those Shit. are the people that need to have power. Yeah. Those are the people that actually care about the region and don't care about you know, just destroying Israel. Right. And unfortunately, our perception of we've given them, we've tried with them is who's them? Them is the Palestinian Authority. Them is Hamas. And neither Hamas nor the Palestinian Authority represent the Palestinian people. So I, I think actually we never tried to make to coexist with Palestinians because Israelis and Palestinians never sat at the same table. It was always a puppet that was there using their people as a sort of way to gain all this money. Because if you look at Arafat and Khalid Mashal and Abu Mazen, why do they have hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in their bank account? It's not because they invested in Bitcoin at the right time. It's because all this money from this conflict being poured in in order to help the people is helping their pockets grow larger.
So, yeah. so I think that we need to focus on empowering local communities, which is a need for Palestinians. This is part of the things that they need. Well, you know, for for Western people, it's very hard to understand. You know, the 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 Middle Eastern cultures of of tribalism. You know, that's where the the colonial powers messed up too. You know, they made borders. Yeah. You know, like yeah. Transjordania, Syria, Lebanon, a little bit for England, a little bit for France, <clears throat> but these borders didn't matter to the to the local people and this is what the ottomans did right they just controlled the whole area but they uh, dealt with the the tribes right so i guess that's why they you know got to stay there for 500 years but um i gotta tell you this anecdote i've talked to a a very highly positioned uh, dutch politician who was actually involved involved with the negotiations between Bill Clinton, uh, Yasser Arafat, and uh, Ehud Barak. Mm -hmm. At some point, um, you know, um, he went to Ehud Barak and Barak uh, told him, you can go to uh, Arafat right now and you can tell him he's going to get East Jerusalem because this was the last point they were arg arguing about, you know. And basically, if Arafat would have agreed to that, all of his... Uh, 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 all of the, the, the stuff he wanted would be met. You know, all of his demands would be met at the point. <clears throat> so he goes to uh, Yasser Arafat and he refuses the offer and immediately started to negotiate about European money coming to him. He already disqualified the whole plan. He was just there because he had to be there. You know, it was his, you know, he had to show a good face, you know, goodwill. But he didn't want the peace at all. He just wanted the money. This was what a very highly positioned uh, politician told me. And and I would say further, I think any offer of a two-state solution is a disgrace and an insult to both peoples. So even though I'm not a fan of Arafat at all, and I don't think he had the best of intentions, and I think he was there mostly to profit from the situation, I think offering a two-state solution is something ineffective and is something disrespectful to both cultures and both needs of the peoples. Right. So even if we look at the offered plans, of course they were rejected because none of them were realistic and none of them should have ever happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy that uh, a two-state solution never happened. Uh, most Israelis and most Palestinians reject this idea and it's, it's really another foreign idea, right? Who said that we should divide this land? The, the British proposed it and then the UN voted on it, the partition plan. Who is the rest of the world to tell us, Israelis and Palestinians, that are connected to this land, to divide our land, and to give the you know the the story of Melech Shlomo? I don't know if you know the story of when King uh, King Solomon had the two mothers with the one baby. The two mothers come and both claim to be the mothers of this baby. Now King Solomon didn't know who the mother was. You didn't have DNA testing back then. You didn't have registration uh, when people were born. So he says, you know what? Yeah, to, to the viewers, maybe we're, we're going to cut the baby in half and you're going to get one half and you're going to get one half. And one mother said, sure. And the other mother said, no, it's actually her baby. And that's when he was actually able to see who the real mother is, because a mother would never cut her baby in two. And so if we're the real people of this land, we would never cut this land in two. Wow. If it's wow. just about having uh, a safe place, then we should have gone somewhere else. You know, this is not about just getting things the, the easiest way. This is not just about having a country. We could have gone anywhere else. This is about being back with this land that is our soulmate. And that doesn't mean other people can't also have such a special relationship with this land too. But this land cannot be divided, not with a physical wall and not with the walls within our minds, our souls, and our hearts. Wow, that's, that's a beautiful, uh, yeah, that's a beautiful way of thinking about uh, the solution. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think uh, we, uh, we could end this. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Rudy Rochman. Uh, I think he's an amazing guy doing amazing work and I'm going to be following him. So uh, check him out on his YouTube channel. And if you like my podcast, Fighting with Moskvich, Vechten with Moskvich, uh, please subscribe. Uh, it's free and, uh, you know, I get to make more free content. So thank you for watching. Bye-bye.